let's all give a warm welcome to this brilliant, brilliant makeup effects artist, uh, Barry Gower. Put your hands together in cyberspace. Barry, along with his equally brilliant wife, Sarah, uh, have been running the company BGFX in the UK since I think 2010. Is that correct, Barry? That's yeah, the yeah, that's I fine. And doing incredible work. You've seen their work in many, 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 many shows, TV, film, uh, a few standouts. Game of Thrones, hello, Granger Things, incredible work. And going a little further back, Chernobyl, just so many incredible shows. You guys just put out fantastic work. And today we're going to talk all about their work on The Last of Us, the hit HBO show based on the video game of the same name, starring Pedro Pascal, who we all love, and Bella Ramsey, who we also love. And we are going to talk all about this. So let's just start from the beginning, Barry. How did you hook up with the creators, Craig uh, Mazin and Neil Druckmann? How did this all come to be? How did you get involved? Well, we um, we worked with Craig Mason originally on Chernobyl um, back in uh, 2017, 2018, and it was our last season on Game of Thrones, and which was also HBO. And we we got a pro uh, I was approached by a um, longtime friend, uh, hair and makeup designer uh, Daniel Parker, who used to have his own makeup effects company here in England, uh, Animated Extras. And he then went on to be um, a makeup designer himself. And he approached me, it was like the December, I think, of 2017, saying I've been approached about a project. He wouldn't tell me what it was, but he said there's going to be a lot of loads of prosthetics, loads of aging, all, all kinds of character makeups. And then I, I learned it was Chernobyl. And um, we were right in the thick of Game of Thrones. We were like, we would be idiots to take another big show on. But we did anyway, and uh, we juggled the two shows at the same time. And we had a team out in Lithuania shooting on um, Chernobyl, doing all the radiation burn victims. And this was with Craig Mason, who'd, who'd written the show uh, for HBO. And, and um, I didn't really have that much to do with Craig on, on, on the season of uh, Chernobyl. And it, it wasn't until after the season, actually, that we spoke quite a lot and... Uh, we bumped into Craig at uh, the Emmy Awards later that year. We were had been nominated for both Chernobyl and Game of Thrones, and he said um, we should keep in touch. I've got I've got something else um, coming up in the pipeline, and there's a lot of stuff for you guys. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, it sounds it sounds very interesting, and it was like about um, twelve months later, I saw the press release that Craig was going to be adapting um, The Last of Us, so I. I was immediately emailing him and I, I started stalking him for about six months or so saying, oh, we know what's happening, what's happening. And, and he he was very sweet, bless his heart. So if it was up to me, I'd get the entire Chernobyl team back together and we would do The Last of Us together. He said the only spanner in the wheel really could be is that, that it's possibly shooting in Canada. And he said, I don't know how that would work. He said, if it was up to me, I'd hire you. But this is going to be up to the big wigs at HBO. So um, we kept in touch. And there was another big producer, HBO producer, Carolyn Strauss, who also did um, Game of Thrones, who uh, I knew very well. So I was speaking to Carolyn and she said, yeah, it is it's potentially going to be Calgary in Canada. So I'm not quite sure how this will work logistically for you guys being a, a UK based effects company. And um, I said, well, at the moment moment we, we, we're used to doing a show that's not in our country because we spent five years on game of thrones we would do our build in england and even though northern ireland was just across the sea it was only about an hour away by a flight we built everything at our studio in south london and we'd fly everything across for filming and i said it in a way it's it's very similar we were doing stranger things at the time which was in atlanta and we only really had one main character the vecna character for stranger things but again, we were flying backwards and forwards. And it was a big, really big build for us, that show. And we said, so logistically, we could we could do this. You know, we, we could build the majority of the prosthetics and makeup effects in the UK and have a micro team out there in Calgary who would be there for the entire shoot. And um, and they um, they were for it um so they we, we sort of joined later that year, we did concept designs. This was 20. 20 i think it was 2020 yeah it was it was just after covid so um we started concept art, uh, designs just prior to that christmas 
Barry, yeah. I just have a quick okay. question because you said um, as soon as you heard about the project, you started stalking Craig. And I'm wondering if before this design phase, did you get a copy of the game and, and check it out and get a feel for what you'd be getting into or no? I still haven't played the game. Um, <laughs> no, I um, we um, fully. It's it's my we we've got an eleven year old, about to be twelve year old daughter next week, and we just bought her a PlayStation Five. Not that she knows, um, but um, so and I've just bought her The Last of Us. So um, the I mean, I I knew about the IP and the creature design of the game, and I knew about the clickers and the infected characters because it, it's you know it's such a huge successful property that I'd seen all these amazing designs. I, I remember I remember seeing a beautiful silicon bus that vincent van dyke and his team had done for i think it was promotional uh purposes for sony and thinking oh my god that's gorgeous you know the design is beautiful so i i knew about the creature design and um when sarah and i heard that he was adapting the game we went online and we found like a youtube video which was a walk through of the game which was about four hours long and we, we basically just watched it uh, over a couple of nights and it, that was the, the season one of the, of the show. So um, still to this day, I haven't played the game. Hopefully I'll change that next week. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know whether Neil, Neil Druckmann knows that I haven't actually played the game yet. But um, um, yeah, we, we were hooked just from watching that video. And we realized that this, was, this would be a, a dream project for any makeup effects company uh, to do. So... Um, so a question for you, Barry, you know, when, when uh, you come on board a project and there's a bit more freedom of design, that's one thing. And then you come on a project like this and you have a fan base who knows these, these creatures and the des designs clearly worked. It was a hit game. So what yeah. were those conversations about how much to stick to uh, what had been established and how much wiggle room you had to, to work with new, new concepts? It's, it, it's really interesting, actually. I think, Matt, you say that there are two very different approaches when you, you join a project and uh, we were very lucky with game of thrones we had complete leeway we designed all the characters from the ground up and um they weren't already pre-determined designs and with the last of us obviously it's it's a massive franchise already pre-designed characters and creatures uh, speaking with Neil and Craig, Neil, Neil, even though we knew we had to pay an awful lot of fan service to the to the game players, um, he was very keen for us to put our own new spin on uh, the creatures as well. So we hired a couple of uh, creature concept artists, um, UK uh, two UK guys actually, Rob Bliss and uh, a guy called um, Simon Weber, who does an awful lot of designs for Legacy actually uh, on a lot of their characters, and they we started looking at. The clickers we looked at all the naughty dog uh, concept art that had been done for the games and we, we we used a lot of that as a springboard and we we did some new designs with new shapes and forms slightly different anatomy here and there and we spent about two months doing concept art uh, and we had a lot of really good feedback from neil and craig and it got to the point where we were still in early prep but there, there were, i think there's only, only so many times that you can you, you, you know trying to reinvent the wheel it's quite difficult when you have a very very strong creature design so we we got to a point where we were happy with a lot of concept work but we were going to have to start doing our first uh, clicker makeup test so we went back to neil and said you know of the design work we've done it'd be really good if you could compile almost like a greatest hits of the naughty dog uh, design design work and then we could take you know um uh leaves out of all those books really and start blocking out a makeup so he sent us, it was maybe 10 to 15 images of all the strongest clicker designs that Naughty Dog had done for the games. And we also looked at video gameplay as well. And then we started our first sculptures, and it was in about the January of that year. And it was just interesting. It's not, not only the, the clickers, but the infected characters, the bloater, all, all the creature design of um, season one of The Last of Us was heavily based on the game. And we were able to just tweak things and also for a lot of these characters which were going to be practical as well in camera we would not only able to tweak the design slightly in our favor but we also had to consider that there was going to be a performer underneath that who would need to be wearing these extensive prosthetics or, or body suits or whatever so um there 
you know, you could take the design from the game, but there would need to be some compromises or nuances that you would need to change to make these work physically over a, over a performer. Wonderful. So let's let's move past that initial design phase, the greatest hits phase, and getting it all down to what these things are going to look like. And let's get into the builds. Uh, I think the best thing to do is take them through level of infection on up. So why don't we start with the runners, the earliest infected? There's so much variety in the runners uh, that I saw. There's early, there's little, it's been in them a little longer. So let's talk about that. What what were the design challenges and what were the build challenges on those makeups? So I think I think the infected characters were the, the they were the hardest characters for us to test and establish uh, for the show. Uh, the clickers all, were almost pre-designed and we could pretty much follow it to the T. With the infected, it was trying to find out how many different types of infected, how many stages we would have throughout the show. Uh, so it, it was it was really the, the infected were the most difficult um, part of our design phase because uh, our history with working with Craig Mason on Chernobyl, he, he loves stages. He absolutely loves different stages. And our radiation burn victims ended up having about six different stages of burns. And um, for the infected, it was a similar sort of amount, really. Um, so we started with very subtle raised veins, which were Bondo appliances. I uh, don't know whether you're all aware of like Pro, Pro Bondo, which is like the Prose transfer appliances. So we, we started off with three dimensional veins uh, sort of go, coming from eyes and noses and orifices on the face with inflamed makeup and um, glossy sort of textures around the eyes. We use different products around the eyes to make the glossy areas. And then we had a, a second stage, which was slightly more extensive raised veins with small fungus starting to erupt from the skin. And then stage three, stage four, stage five, everything was sort of getting larger in, in size and scale and coverage as well over the heads. So the point where we're starting to get into our latter stages, four and five, we're starting to get more infection over the body. And we had body appliances, um, we had various people in lots of different costumes, some without sleeves, so we could put infection on the arms. I think one of the things with our huge crowd infected days, which was always going to be the challenge, were, were the numbers. And you're OK if you have a scene with two, three infected characters. But when you have sequences, which we had 60 to 80 characters in some sequences, which would have really extensive makeups, and obviously you need to give some of them body coverage as well. So we work very closely with Cynthia Summers, the costume designer and her team. And we made uh, these poem lycra tops and bottoms, which had pre-glued appliances um, already pre-glued and artworks on top. And she worked with her team to expose these fungal appliances coming through on the shoulders and the chest and the arms. So we could easily slip those on on the day. So it would completely reduce our application. But, um, I'd say we probably spent the best part of about four to six months testing the the infected stages. We had one round of tests doing all the different stages, which didn't work too well at all. We were trying different materials. We were trying a lot of foam latex for the larger fungal pieces, some of which worked, some of which looked exactly like what it was, foam latex. And, and I think one really interesting thing is, is when you actually look at a lot of fungus and mushrooms, it... At the end of the day, it looks like painted foam latex. There's there's no two ways about it. So I, I, I will say, out of all the projects we've done, I think The Last of Us is probably one of the projects where I've done the most amount of research I've ever done on a project for looking at mushrooms and fungus and all kinds of infection, raised veins, colours, textures, all kinds of you know, matte dry finishes, glossy finishes. And at my desktop was just full of all these different type of folders of mushrooms. And, and the irony is I hate mushrooms. I can't stand mushrooms. I don't eat mushrooms. So it wasn't exactly the, the best project to get on with the, the, the subject matter. But, um, but if anybody needs any mushroom reference whatsoever, come and see me because I've got so many mushrooms on my computer. <laughs> so you've heard of exposure therapy. If someone has a phobia, the best thing to do is just expose them to oh it. God, so this didn't absolutely. cure you of your dislike of mushrooms at all? I still hate mushrooms. Yeah, <laughs> I still hate mushrooms. Can't stand them. <laughs> So, so I want to ask. You said um, you 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 played with all different materials. So, did you? Are you saying that the larger 
on on the infected, the runners, the larger growths were were foam. Yeah, there was and, no, no heavy floppies, and, silicone chunks hanging off them. And anything on the body which came through costume tended to be foam latex. Mm -hmm. um, when we did, we, so we had two clickers. Where the first time we're introduced to the clickers, I think is that. Before we two. go to the clickers, we got to wrap up the runners. Oh. We're going to talk a lot about those clickers because they are incredible. I, I have another question for you because you talked about reference. And I think one of the things that distinguishes this zombie show from other uh, zombie shows is that under skin network of stuff that does not look like veins. So you mentioned you researched fungus. Were there any other references that helped uh, inform what those patterns would be like under the skin? Absolutely. Yeah, we looked at um, parasitic diseases, things like larvae growing under the skin. Um, we also looked at there is uh, there's a parasite that attacks uh, plants and leaves. They're called leaf miners. And um, what, one of the reasons the first round of tests didn't work as well as we hoped were because when we were doing raised veins and patterning on the skin, something that um, Craig and Neil were quite keen about was that in order for us to detach the zombie tropes and stereotypes, they didn't want the veins and raised veins and everything to look vascular as such. They wanted it to look like people had been bitten, uh, they'd either been infected through a bite or airborne spores or something. And the idea that this very real parasite, cordyceps, and that attacks insects and the insect kingdom, they were basically looking at the science thinking if a human had been infected by this parasite, the par in theory, the parasite would be making a run for the brain in, or in order to take over the host and be able to control the human. Uh, so they wanted to show the travel of this parasite under the skin making its way to the to the core um, center of the, the the human but they didn't want it to be traveling up through veins itself the, the idea was that it was burrowing its way under the skin in its own journey basically so um our first round of tests showed vascular looking raised veins which is something they weren't very keen about so we we looked at different organic shapes we looked at um and these leaf miners, if you Google leaf miners, that you get beautiful shapes on, on, on leaves, which are very organic, which look like a lot of our shapes. But um, but Neil also, uh, Neil Druckmann was like, if you look at um, like jellyfish things as well, that beautiful organic shapes you get with these really random um, sort of shapes and swirls. That was something else we used as reference as well um, to show the travel of these uh, veins. And uh, so, again, it's, it's trying to reinvent raised veins without them looking like zombie veins as such and it looking more organic more fungal as well and uh with a mix of the raised veins and and things erupting through the skins and little shelf mushrooms and uh fungus that's how we um did, we achieved the looks of the earlier stage and we, we all we really re refer to them as stages as well stage one to five rather than their aim uh, names the runners or the stalkers or the what have yous really so we rarely ever refer to them as the as the the, the, the types of infected that you have in the game it was always sort of by number and uh, as i say craig was very keen to create as many stages as possible so originally we were looking at about three stages but it eventually got to about five or six stages before we got to those later thicker characters well, the work on that first level is so gorgeous. And and folks, we're going to be taking this interview and turning it into a blog article. And Barry has provided us with so many beautiful images of the making of all the stages. And you really get some great shots of that under skin work. Um, and Bella Ramsey has that one on her arm. And I mean, it just really becomes a signature of this show is uh, you don't want that pattern to show up under your skin. That's bad. Um, <laughs> All right, so clickers. Let's talk about those clickers. That might have been the first image I saw. I think it was in the trailer, the one that really popped for me when I said, oh, I got to watch this show because I hadn't played the video game either. And I really wasn't aware of the designs from the video game either. But when I saw the clickers in one of the first teaser trailers, I went, what is this? So let's talk about it. I know the design was pretty much established from the game, as you mentioned. Where did you have any wiggle room on design? And then we can talk about the build. Yeah, we we had we had a little bit of wiggle room again when um, 
uh, we had our uh, concept artists um, draw up the first uh, their illustrations. They they looked um, to the game. They looked at uh, the Naughty Dog artist that did designs for the game. And then I spoke to them about slightly refining some of the forms on the crowns of the clickers. Uh, so um, if anybody hasn't seen the the, the, the characters, the clickers, they um, it's 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 like the most extreme version of these infected characters. And the idea is that the fungus has grown so great inside the skull of the host that it's broken the skull and everything's broken out like petals and has formed these huge kind of sort of pe petal shelf mushrooms over the over the, the head of the of the victim uh, um what one of the things that we discussed quite early on was trying to achieve the look of this crown which has a very inverted sort of crevice in the center of the design which in three quarters of profile would almost be negative space so that would be within in the the head of the performer so we work very closely with um, Alex Wang, who is the uh, visual effects producer on the show, uh, visual effects supervisor. And our first test really with the clicker makeup was to establish what would be practical on the day and what may need to be augmented digitally in post. And originally we, we sculpted a makeup and we did a like a clay bust, which had that area removed of the life cast. So we could then sculpt the interior going into the interior of the uh, performer's head. We scanned that and we gave Alex a digital file. So he then had a digital asset. And when we tested, when we sculpted the makeup, we sculpted it as a whole. And we split up the makeup so it had a separate crown, which came over the head. That was in foam latex because it was going to be a really big, heavy piece. And then everything below the crown, we had a, a cowl piece, neck piece, which came down to below, uh, like top of the chest. Uh, that was cast in silicone and um, uh, plat gel 10. And when we sculpted the crown, we also um, separated an area around the center of the head there. So we sculpted it all as if it was we were trying to achieve it practically uh, in camera. And we cheated everything forward on the, on the head, the, the crown, the nose. We had these dentures. We cheated everything forward. So in profile, we could achieve that deep crevice. But obviously, we could only go so far. We then cut that area of the sculpture out and we floated that off the life cast, put that to one side. And that area there, we molded the whole crown with that area missing. So we could stick that on. And we'd have that area of the face missing and we could paint it like bright green, chroma key green. So the VFX department could then replace that digitally in post. But that element that we took off there, that section, we also molded that. So we had a separate plug which we could also stick on on the day um, so we could try and achieve it in, in camera. And when we tested it, I think Alex was surprised and Neil and Craig were surprised at how much we could get away with practically on the day. So we actually processed the makeup as a whole. And Alex said, don't worry about the green areas in the face. Process it as a practical makeup and we will shoot it on the day and we'll see what we see and if we need to do something we can gently augment it in post-production so um kind of what you see in the final episode is pretty much our makeup there are a couple of shots and a wetter digital worked on and they 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 it wasn't so much they enhanced actually the center of the face it's actually the dentures themselves we had a few problems with here and there so the, the special effects dentures, we had two hero performers, a guy called Sam and a guy called uh, Olivier, both from Canada. We took uh, dental casts of, of their own teeth and we created like a vacuform gum tray uh, shield, which fits onto their own teeth. But we also sculpted dentures on the outside of their lips, like a veneer, which went over the front of their lips, top and bottom. And by doing that, we cheated the whole lot forward and we were able to sculpt that broken cleft in the mouth as well. So we sculpt, when we sculpted the whole makeup originally, those teeth were included on top of the actor's lips. We floated those off, put them to one side. We had the dental plates made, and then we basically assembled the one onto the other with a gap in between, which would allow their lips to sit behind the teeth in front of the gum shields. So I don't know whether any of you have ever made any special effects dentures or anything like like this before but they're super tricky things to make so all those dentures you see on the walking dead that the amazing kmb made i mean they've, they've absolutely nailed it to an art now i've been able 
to make these incredible dentures which sit over the actor's own lips but also clip into their own teeth and give you their illusion that part of the face is missing i think stan winston's did uh, something very similar i think i think stan did it many times yes I mean, and i, I actually really wore i wore something very similar in a planet of the apes makeup test that my father and i did we we had dentures that were beyond our teeth but they were driven by our teeth uh we we had a special device that it's similar to what you're talking about and it creates that extended muzzle and what a genius solution that you guys came up with to allow you to get that that cleft that's it's genius I, I think it's it's interesting. I, we, we always say, what, you know, putting prosthetics over at somebody's face is one thing. I think when you start um, augmenting the mouth or the eyes, it always has such a big effect um, on the final result. So, so the dentures were they play a huge part for clip and makeup, and um, depending on the performer and how how wide they can open the mouth, so the gate of their mouth and their jaw how much they can move their jaw around will dictate the result that you get at the end of the day so there were a couple of shots in there especially on, on three quarters in profile i think one of our guys sam when he opened his mouth i think the dentures themselves actually sort of clocked at a bit of an angle so i know weta digital sort of re-augmented those and realigned them and, and did a few bits and pieces so i think the, the really interesting thing about doing a show of this scale is that Having not done a lot of these processes before, you're kind of, everything's prototype and you're learning a lot of the things from the ground up. You're spending a lot of your research and development time, you'll build, figuring these things out. And you can very quickly run out of time as well. So it could be you start, oh, let's start doing a build in May. We don't start till Jan shoot till January. And you're like, great, let's do it. Suddenly it's December and you've been spending all this time doing tests and you've got to make some stuff. So we very quickly ran out of time. And we had a very big sequence very early up on The Last of Us. And we had thousands and thousands of infected appliances to make, including those clickers as well. So I think that's a very exciting thing going into a second season of a big show like this, knowing all the problems we had and all the interesting things that we worked out on season one. We've, we've now done all the homework and um, we can go into a second season uh, having a lot of answers. How great that you have that foundation to build upon. I, I want to ask you another clickers question because, you know, having occasionally been a guinea pig and been in prosthetics, it, it's very challenging. But these clicker makeups look to me to be very, very challenging because vision. I mean, you got their whole face is covered by a mushroom explosion. How did you how did you handle that that issue? Well, the, 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 the first clicker sequence we ever shot for the show was that episode in uh, the sequence in episode two, when they're in uh, the Bostonian Museum and it's our two performers. And we had the, 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 the clicker crown is sculpted in a way that where these petals are, you have little gaps in between them. And we um, I think we originally put like a black mesh on the interior of the foam latex so it would mask any you wouldn't be able to see their own eyes and they were sculpted asymmetrically as well our two hero clickers were sculpted by we've got two amazing sculptors here um in the uk pat fode and duncan jarman who have been with us for about 10 years now i think i've known duncan for about 25 30 years and they sculpted these two hero clicker makeups and that was one of the things we were concerned about very early on was, was going to be the vision because of the design of these characters so we designed them so they had gaps so the performers could actually see through these gaps. And we also had the option, we could take the crown on and off as well uh, in between uh, setups and takes. So they would have complete vision and then we'd be able to put the crown back on, glue things back around and continue. The problem we had with that first sequence uh, were that the crowns were whole and we didn't have the ability to take the eye section out on those. We were just relying on them seeing through these little sections. And um, what you see is kind of what you got in that set. It was extremely dark. It was extremely smoky and uh, the vision, even if you weren't wearing a clicker makeup, was super low. And we had in the set, there were lots of columns, there were lots of cabinets, there were lots of things with mirrors and sculptures and things on. And even even just the crew walking around was sort of bumping into things and knocking stuff over. So for these poor guys in these clicker makeups where we were shooting these sequences, which were like really, really frantic, had little to no vision originally. 
So in a way, when we when we shot that sequence, both Sam and Olivia couldn't see a great deal. And that was really our first dry run of uh, shooting the clickers. So the next time you see the clickers was in an episode, about three uh, episodes later, I think it was episode five, and we had a sequence which we refer to as the cul-de-sac. And we had these two original performers, Sam, Sammy and Olivia, came back because they, they were the best at clicker performers um, that the guys had uh, interviewed for. And um, we sculpted two brand new looks for each of them. And we shot over a period of about two weeks. And those two guys shot four looks in total. And then we had uh, 15 stump, stump performers who wore pullover clicker hoods. And for everybody now, we made these removable eye sections, which were like sort of fungal goggles uh, they could take out. And they had Velcro inside. So we could pop them in, close them up, and then they would shoot and they looked like hero clickers. And then we could kind of rip them out and they would have their eyes exposed and they had complete vision. And the idea was when we were doing the really vigorous, crazy fight sequences with all these stunt guys sort of falling all over each other, they would have their eye uh, areas removed and VFX would replace anything in post-production. So um, vision wasn't great to start off with, and then vision was great by the end of the season. Oh, yeah. Sam, Sam and Olivia, you said their names are. They must have been thrilled in episode five when they had the ability Absolutely. to take that off. My God, they could see. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, I... I can't think of a better segue um, to the bloater uh, because episode five is when that big creature shows up in that cul-de-sac sequence. Let's talk about it. I know that Weta uh, played a very big part in executing what we see finally on screen, but you guys went to all the trouble of building it fully practically. And let's talk about that process. And let's talk about why it was so important that you build the full suit practically and have it on set moving around. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think very early on, again, in chats with the VFX producer, Alex, he he was very keen that um, not only were, was he going to have all the environments uh, and all the other digital effects to do for the show, but the, the creatures and, and the infected play such a huge part of this show that he was quite um, keen early on that we we gave him as much as we could practically. And he said, we will shoot everything on the day and we'll try and use as much as we can. And if we can't use it, we will use it for reference. So our teams at Weta Digital and all the other digital effects uh, facilities would have a template to be able to follow. It's very common when we're on a film or a TV show that uh, it's very common, lots of practical stuff sometimes gets replaced or augmented or from day one, the two are gonna combine to co create the final result. And it's quite common that you get approached by the visual effects team to provide uh, what's called a lighting stand-in. And it could be a head on a pole or it could be a complete figure you could wheel in on set um, or it could just be a, a, just a, a swatch of skin, creature skin or something. But it gives them the perfect reference on the day in the lighting on that set um, for colours, textures, shapes, um, whether something's matte or shiny. So um, we're always keen to have a very close relationship with VFX and just give them as much as possible. So. The clickers and the infected, that was very much the case. And we ended up seeing a lot of them practically in the final show. With the bloater, it was always said from day one, we don't know how much will end up being practical uh, in the end show. But ideally, we want a guy in a complete rubber suit there on the day that can give eye line to the actors and can perform as this creature. So we enlisted um, one of our old friends, a uh, UK stunt performer, Adam Basil. Who Adam's about six foot eight. He's huge. He's built like a house. He's a really muscular, very well toned, um, athletic stunt performer. And he's played a lot of creature suits before. I think he was the Beast in, in Beauty and the Beast uh, a few years ago, uh, the film with Emma Watson. And he was also, he played a character we did for the second Doctor Strange film, who was a, a big green minotaur, which was shot an awful lot with him. And then you, you see him for about two seconds in the film. Um, so he he, know, he knows creature suits uh, so inside out. And um, we scanned, um, 3D scanned Adam's bod uh, body head to toe. And we had his body um, 3D printed in, in a rigid foam and his head 3D printed in a resin. We uh, did his hands in a resin. We jigsaw puzzled everything together. And then we molded his whole body and we created a plaster of Paris body of Adam. And 
we sculpted the entire bloated soup in a in a wax based uh, modeling clay. I know I know in the US, um, I think it's um, Chavant or Ch uh, Chavant clay, is Chavant is one of the the primary. Yeah, Chavant medium, monster clay to some degree, but yes, yeah, Chavant. Although for a suit that size, they might have gone with wed clay. I don't know. Um, yeah, but Chavant. Yep. So we we knew that we were going to be um, splitting the suit up into several parts. So we treated it very much like just a head and shoulders makeup and how we would normally split up a complex, say, aging makeup. And um, before we started sculpting on the Plaster of Paris body, we painted the whole lot, um, a whole body in a liquid called uh, Scopas parting agent. I don't know whether any of you guys have used that, but it's it, it's it's basically a it's like a soap at the end of the day. And we painted the whole Plaster Paris body in a soap, dried it, and then sculpted. We, we use um, a modeling clay really similar to Chavon, but it's called Plastiline. And it's, it's a French uh, modeling um, clay. And it comes in lots of different hardnesses from something really, really soft, almost like a, a firm butter, to something very, very firm, almost like a granite. And we use um, sort of a mid-grade modeling clay. Sculpted the body as a whole. And we then split the body up into sections and molded the um, soup, uh, the clay sculpture in, in several parts and foamed them all in foam latex. And we have um, an incredible um, fabrication team here in the UK. Uh, they have a company called Stitches and Glue, uh, Becky Johnson and her partner, Paul. And um, they fabricated this whole lycra soup for us, which we could foam the appliances onto and it had a zipper up the back and we had separate arms that we foamed and we uh, the, the guys basically stitched the whole lot together so we ended up with a big thick pair of foam rubber pants a foam rubber top with a zipper at the back and a foam rubber head and they all had sort of popper attachments all the way around the neck around the back around the waist and everything popped together so the beauty of this was it was a big rubber suit that we could get Adam into. And I think we, the guys got him into it in the end, they were, it's about 25, 30 minutes. They could get him into the whole suit. So he wouldn't have to go through a whole prosthetic application on his body, like something like Jamie Campbell Boa in, in Vecna, which was like an, an eight or a nine hour application. So we, we could get Adam ready in 25, 30 minutes. We'd have him sitting on set and we could pop his head off at any time and we could cool him down. And um, so he performed the whole character uh, in the show. And um, I think I, I, I think uh, eventually what happened was the scale and the size of the bloater was something in post-production. They were reviewing all the, all the scenes. And I think they realized they needed Adam to be about a foot taller than what he was. Um, the actual movement of the body, even though he's an incredible performer, he he's theoretically wearing... Um, <clears throat> He's wearing a mattress, pretty much, or a sofa. That's that's what I compare it to. Uh, and this big, heavy foam rubber suit, and he's throwing people all over the shop on, on set, and he's doing the most incredible job. But bless Adam. I think they were after something um, which anatomically moved a little swifter, and also the scale was a little um, more um, menacing. So Weta uh, scanned um, our uh, actor in his suit, and uh, took many, many uh, photogrammetry photos as well. And they were able to use our fully painted suit with all the textures. He had all these little spines of hair punched into him as well. And they took a uh, scan of him when he was very glossy, when he was very matte. Um, they had a scan of our sculpture as well, our original sculptor. So they were able to use that and um, play with that uh, model um, to create their fully digital um, character in post-production. Well, I, I have no doubt that that the fact that you you built it, that it was on set, it was there being shot, uh, really helped the folks at Weta ground that character. And I think it's one of the reasons it looks so good on camera. So a uh, wonderful marriage of practical and digital approaches. Really, really great. And a lot cooler than just wheeling a, a static figure on set for a minute and get their lighting reference. You actually had a, a guy in a suit on set. So that's that's fantastic. There are some questions here, and I promised you we'd be done at uh, at ten. So I'm I'm taking a look. There's some questions. I I want I want to give you three minutes or less to talk about the brilliant old age makeups, primarily Nana, um, who's in one of the earliest maybe episode one I believe. Nana goes ahead and eats her family, 
but uh, I hear that was an old age makeup and you didn't find someone that old. Can you tell us a little bit about that makeup? Then we're going to take student questions. Yeah, it's 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 funny because um, I don't think we found out until really late in the day that that was going to be an old age makeup. And I think we assumed reading the scripts, it would be a fairly elderly person and then it would be a stunt double who would probably be shot over the shoulder and do a lot of the frantic movement. And then um, Craig decided he was quite keen that we we hired an actress who was of a reasonable age. I mean, um, Wendy Gorling was an incredible Canadian actress. Uh, forgive me, Wendy, if I say, I, I think Wendy was maybe 60, uh, early 60s, and they wanted Nana to be late 80s. So they wanted to um, put prosthetics on her. But I think, again, with, with Craig having done all the radiation burn victims, he's very much about realism. And uh, he seemed very confident that we could do a, a beautiful old age makeup. But also, we were quite keen not to completely cover uh, Wendy in prosthetics. So it was actually a fairly, it was a fairly subtle makeup in a way. We, we had a scan in Canada. They sent us the file. We printed the head over here. And um, I had about a week, I think. We had about a week to sculpt it, mould it and turn it around before we tested it in Calgary. So I think um, I, I sculpted some little cheek appliances um, she had a chin appliance. She had a little uh, triangular neck wattle appliance, which th those are all silicone. And then she had some little um, prosate transfer lip appliances that if ever you do an old age makeup and uh, the beautiful thing about using prosate transfer appliances is if you have cheek appliances and they go down just past the nasal labial folds there. If you have little Bondo appliances that can just pop over those edges, they save you bacon and you don't have to worry about edges for the rest of the day. And it's the same on chins as well. Any little Bondo appliance is great for blending. But because of because the time or lack of time, um, we decided rather than making conventional molds for cheeks and necks and things, we floated the sculptures off and we flattened them on a board. Um, so the cheeks, the lips, the neck, they were all flattened. She had these little raised kind of moles, skin tags on her head as well. We just flattened those on the board. Uh, it was only the chin, which we made a conventional positive and negative mold for because it has so many contours and forms to fold around. It's really difficult to flatten a sculpture and hope you're going to get what you started off with. So we made a proper mold for that and then flat molds for everything else. And the turnaround doing flat molds is so fast that we were able to do it in a week. And then Chris, the um, hair uh, designer on The Last of, the, Last of Us, uh, uh, she had a wig made for Wendy, uh, but we had to give her a receding hairline because Wendy had, had a really thick, really good head of hair. So we put just a vinyl stock ball cap on her and she had this white wig which showed a scalp through, through and we just pax painted and mottled it all up and then stuck the appliances on. I think we stuck all the whole makeup on in about two hours, I think, something like that. And, well, uh, it's, you know, old age makeup is one of the hardest challenges there is. And uh, it's a beautiful makeup. It's shocking that you you had so little time and that it turned out so flawlessly. So congratulations. With that, we're going to ask some student questions. We have just a little over 10 minutes left. So I'll try and do a quick speed round here. Our, our first one uh, is from Jeffrey. What makeup products did you use for painting the green screen color onto the actors when you were going to be uh, potentially having digital at fill in the clicker flowers? What'd you use? Was it packs, alcohol-based paints? Uh, that's a really good question. And that's something that um, we, we spent a while on Game of Thrones finding the right products because we had a lot of uh, negative space areas on our zombies on uh, Game of Thrones. And we found the best results to get the brightest, pingiest uh, green is we use a, uh, a bright Light green Pax paint to start off with, uh, which we mix ourselves. And we, uh, I think Liquitex do a really bright, vibrant um, day glow green, which is obviously, so it's brilliant paint, uh, Liquitex paint, um, water and prosade to mix your Pax paint. We would paint that over the area first, dry that thoroughly. So you've got an elastic um, uh, paint on the skin. And then uh, Cryolan do a vibrant day glow green uh, aqua color paint. Um, which you paint over the packs. Don't do it the other way around because it will crack and all the paint comes off, which we discovered. So um, bright packs paint first, then bright green aqua color over the top. And it's really, really punchy. Excellent. We have another question here. This is from Victoria. Do you have a particular animal, fungi, insect, or other kind of real creature that you like to turn to for inspiration when you need a design idea in a hurry? 
I think when we when we were looking at the um, all the variety of reference that we found, um, something that there are different types breeds of mushrooms, I guess. Um, and for all our clickers, uh, we you, we were looking at reference of a mushroom called uh, chicken of the woods or chicken of the forest. And they're the huge, vibrant yellow and orange, massive fungus that you, you find in the forests. And all those undulating shapes with kind of knobbly popcorny bits on the end, they look exactly like our clickers. And, and they look like somebody's been in the forest running foam latex everywhere because they, they do look like foam latex. But um, chicken of the woods were very popular and uh, there were a variety of different shelf mushrooms. The bloater, we looked at uh, puffer. There, there we go, chicken of the woods. Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, and the bloater had a lot of clusters of these pufferball mushrooms as well, uh, or pufferball fungus. And they were kind of like domes with these little kind of home uh, holes where all the spores would come out of. But yeah, we had a lot of favorites, a lot of favorites. Uh, while we're, you, you mentioned clickers and how they look like they might be foam latex, what did you paint them with? Were they airbrushed? What did you? What paints did you choose for those? We airbrushed them. We used um, rubber cement, which um, is a base that is it's a very very uh, smelly and uh, as has a solvent base to it. I think it's naphtha, which is the base, which is basically like lighter fluid, uh, which you you can mix with different paints and uh, use it sprays like a gum over first, and you can build it up in layers. But it's very 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 thin. And it's different to using like a Pax paint on foam latex because you can do lots and lots of layers, lots and lots of colors. But when you stretch and move the foam, it looks like it's hardly got any product on whatsoever. But we used a mix of those. We used a, a mix of water colored, uh, water based inks as well, some mixed with Prosade. Um, so we formed a, a fine uh, Pax paint. And then um, skin illustrators as well, we used as well on, on top of some of the, the makeups. We have some questions here about 3D printing, because you mentioned your use of 3D printing with your life cast. So this is from Jeffrey. How much of a cost difference is scanning and printing a life cast uh, versus traditional life casting? And what are the advantages versus disadvantages of either? Brilliant. Really good question. So we've, we've only really jumped into the 3D world only about 18 months ago. We were one of the last maker effects companies to do that. And I think it's, you know, it's it's not far off the costs now. If you think of if you're going to life cast in a silicone rubber and a plaster bandage to do your shell on the outside, you need to think about the labor of your uh, staff who are going to be doing the life cast as well. We would normally have about three to four people doing a full head cast. So if you say you need their time of, say, two hours for preparation to do the life cast and then take the life cast afterwards, to then pour in a plaster cast. We have one technician who takes the scan and then he processes the data. And then we have a printer printing the file. So we're not paying for the labor necessarily of the printer. Right? We're paying for the um, electricity and the materials of the printer. But I would say it roughly adds up to something reasonably similar. I mean, we could probably do a life cast and cast a plaster cast cast head for probably about 1500 pounds 2000 pounds which would probably be about maybe about two thousand dollars maybe something like that and we could probably do a scan and process the file and do a 3d print for about the same amount of money i'd say for about, okay, about okay so given that the, the financials are about equal what are the advantages and disadvantages and why would you choose one over the other the, but they both have pros and cons so um life casting you um you get the best detail you will ever get from a life casting product, uh, like a life form or body form or something like that. Body double, I think, uh, used in the States. Uh, you get all the pore texture, which is absolutely beautiful. But depending on how much product you get on, you can get distortion from the weight of the product. You can't have your eyes open. Uh, you can't necessarily have the mouth open. And it's also the comfort of the actor as well, who has to sit there for however long having the product put over him. Um, but the skin detail is perfect, absolutely beautiful. With a 3D scan and a 3D print, obviously you have the convenience of an actor just sitting there whilst you either do a handheld scan or you have hundreds of cameras around him to do the photogrammetry. So it's a lot more comfortable, a lot more convenient for the actor. You can have eyes open, you can have mouth open, you can have any expression you like, and the form is perfect, it's bang on. 
but the skin detail isn't as great as a life cast mm -hmm. it's very close now it is getting very close but it is not as great so we always say we always try to use the best of both worlds so we tend to do a 3d scan uh, scan and have a print of an actor's head but we also do a separate face cast so we'll have all the poor details mm -hmm. so when you come to fine detailing and pouring you've got the face cast to use as perfect reference Be beauty of 3d scans now is you can sculpt a prosthetic makeup and you can take it right under the eyelids because they've got their eyes open yes so it's and you don't have any of the weight pulling the skin down and all that. A couple, we have four minutes left, so we're going to try and speed through a couple more questions here. Uh, this is from Alexandra. Were there any differentiation in the makeups depending on where the affected were located geographically? Colors that you might have painted them or types of fungi? That's that's really interesting. That's something we spoke about quite early on, actually, in our build and our testing period. And we were talking of uh, uh, ways of deciphering the different types of infected, not only by how extensively they're covered in the infection, but also the colours and the finish. So we did actually talk about whether they were going to be in hot and cold environments, uh, moist, dry environments, uh, dark, bright environments. And that would dictate how vibrant the colouring would be on like some of the clickers when you see our clickers actually we do have quite a few different paint schemes and the idea was that they were formed from different types of fungal uh, infection um, so we had some which were very bright and vibrant some which were very gray and green and moldy we have a, a couple of characters which were uh, seen more in kind of sewery dark damp environments so they were very moist and some of those were quite vibrant. And then we had other characters which were seen outside in dry environments. I think it was uh, episode three. We have one infected guy who's quite he's saturated, his makeup is, and quite orange. So we, we definitely looked at that. Differences in colours, uh, paint finishes and dries and moist finishes. Um, that's something we're very much going to be exploring in the next season as well, um, without saying too much. But um, Wonderful. I think we're going to be using locations. Uh, to establish different things. Now that the guys, I'm so sorry. There's a couple of questions we're not going to get to because we're just out of time. But we have to ask this question because you're already working on season two, and you no spoilers, of course. This is from Rob. Do you feel you can still evolve the infection further? Clearly, you know the answer to that, and the answer is yes. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah, very, very much so. Yeah, we've definitely got some very new things we're going to be doing with oh. the infected i i am so excited and i'm sure everyone else is to see what you have in store for us for season two we are going to wrap up this interview thank you all for being here uh we hope you enjoyed hearing from the great barry gower uh have been a fan forever barry it's so great to interview you about this project and uh, we all can't wait for season two so put your hands together for Barry Gower. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.